To borrow a phrase from YouTube user Bad Edit Pro, how's about another video about audio? Hello there everyone, this is UXW Bill, and I want to talk with you on this video about noise reduction processes. Specifically, I'm going to talk about a particular type of noise reduction, of which more later. But first I want to discuss some of the most popular and well-known noise reduction systems out there today. Now by far and away, one of the most well-known noise reduction systems is that of the Dolby B noise reduction system. Dolby B noise reduction is included on many kinds of cassette decks. Everything from the lower mid-range part of the market all the way up to the very highest end of machines. It's also possible to use it with other decks such as reel-to-reel -reel machines and things like that. But its most common use has been with the compact cassette medium. And one of the reasons that I think Dolby B noise reduction, which is commonly just referred to by the average consumer as Dolby noise reduction, one of the reasons I think it took off so well is because of the fact that Dolby B noise reduction doesn't sound objectionable when you don't have a suitable decoder. You can play a Dolby B encoded tape on a piece of equipment that doesn't have a decoding circuit, and if anything, the tape just sounds a little bit on the bright side. Some people might find that objectionable, but the overwhelming majority of people don't. The other thing that I think helped to make a case for Dolby B noise reduction to be included on every cassette deck, I dare say that it's a safe bet that Dolby Laboratories was willing to license the Dolby B technology very cheaply. And most decks that I have seen typically integrate the Dolby B noise reduction function into a single discrete IC that would be cheap and easy to put on a circuit board with a minimum number of required external components. But as you can see here, this good old Technics RSM218, this Sony TC-RX77ES, this simple Optimus SCT86, this Technics RSTR232, and this Pioneer CT-W4000 machine all have at least Dolby B type noise reduction. And the, the fancier machines here, such as the Sony, the Technics, and the Pioneer, all have Dolby C noise reduction as well. Dolby C noise reduction is something that I haven't liked as much. What Dolby C noise reduction does basically is to place two Dolby B decoders back to back with one another, thus resulting in a sort of double encoding and double decoding effect. Now, in theory, this ought to reduce tape noise even further than is normally possible with just the Dolby B system. But what I find is that it seems to step on the music a little bit too much for my liking. I have never really liked the Dolby C noise reduction effect, so I don't typically use it. In fact, the one machine I have heard that seems to do a very credible job on Dolby C noise reduction is the already mentioned Pioneer CT-W4000 machine that I picked up at the Goodwill a couple of months ago. There's also Dolby Type S noise reduction. I don't have a lot of experience with Dolby Type S noise reduction, other than to say that the one demonstration I have seen, courtesy of YouTube user VWestLife and available over on his channel, was striking to say the least. Now he used a high bias tape. I would assume you could probably use Dolby S on a regular bias, a normal bias tape as well, but I don't know that because I've never been fortunate enough to come across a machine that was capable of encoding and decoding in the Dolby S format. It's also said that without a suitable decoder, Dolby S can sound acceptable when it's played on equipment that has at least a Dolby B decoder. So that covers the Dolby noise reduction systems pretty well, but there were a couple of other noise reduction systems on the market as well that didn't enjoy quite as much success or ubiquity as the Dolby systems did. Of the competing systems that were available at the same time the Dolby noise reduction systems were available, they came from a couple of different vendors, one of, one of which was particularly well known in Germany. The Telefunken company marketed a system known as HiCom or HiCom2, which compared very favorably with the Dolby B noise reduction system, and in some cases is said to have outperformed it. Now, I have never had any piece of equipment that was capable of using the HiCom system, so I cannot speak as to its performance. JVC invented a system known as ANRS, or Super ANRS. ANRS was said to be compatible with Dolby B noise reduction, and Super ANRS was said to be comparable, although not necessarily compatible, 
with Dolby C type noise reduction. And JVC manufactured that system, according to what I've heard, mainly to skirt paying any licensing fees to Dolby Laboratories. Another competing system is featured on this Technics RSM234X cassette deck. And that system is DBX. DBX is a much more aggressive noise reduction scheme, and it didn't enjoy much popularity on the compact cassette and reel-to-reel -reel tape front. But certain machines did support it, and for those who did not find its sound objectionable, DBX noise reduction could push the noise basically into the point of invisibility, even on normal bias tape. The only drawback to using DBX noise reduction is that a tape encoded with DBX would not sound acceptable if it was played on a piece of equipment that was not capable of decoding it. The sound is very distorted and overdriven. It's not at all pleasant to listen to. DBX was used for a couple of other things as well. For a time, it was possible to actually purchase a DBX encoded record, which is why many DBX tape decks will have a button on them that says DISC so as to put themselves in a pass-through mode and allow the receiver's tape loop to be turned on, thus providing the DBX noise reduction effect to a suitably encoded record album. And I'm told, although I have never experienced a DBX encoded record, I'm told that with DBX encoding used on a record, it was possible to push the noise down so far that a well-produced record could sound as good as a compact disc, if not better. DBX did find acceptance and high adoption in one particular market, however, and that market was the emerging multi-channel television sound, or MTS system, that was used to facilitate the broadcast of stereo audio alongside television programs in the United States and possibly other countries as well. There are other approaches to reducing or even coming close to eliminating tape noise, such as hiss, without using a noise reduction system. And one of those methods is employed by VHS Hi-Fi and VHS Hi-Fi Stereo VCRs. And that method is known as helical scanning. As mentioned in my kitchen table electronics video, a Hi-Fi or Hi-Fi Stereo VCR not only lays down the traditional analog audio track that is supported by all types of ECRs, it also lays down a very high quality and possibly stereophonic audio track by using rotating heads alongside the video heads on the head drum. This places the audio signal very deep within the magnetic material on the tape, resulting in a high quality signal. Another thing that helps the quality is the helical scanning mechanism itself which actually makes it appear to the recording electronics as though the tape is moving at a much higher speed than it normally would. Running the tape at a faster speed is used on reel-to-reel -reel tape decks. As you can see, this Allied Radio machine has three possible tape speeds. One and seven-eighths inches per second, three and three-quarters inches per second, and its fastest speed at seven and a half inches per second. The higher the speed, the higher fidelity the recorded signal will be, and also, to a certain extent, the less tape noise there will be. Likewise, some reel-to-reel -reel machines record on a wider tape track than others do, and widening the tracks on the tape can also serve to reduce the hiss and noise that is heard when the tape is played back. Of course, there is another way to reduce tape noise, and that's to simply use better tape if your deck will allow you to do so. Practically everybody can use normal bias cassette tape, and it has the most noise out of any variety that you can pick, although good quality tapes, such as this Sony HF60, should produce as good a result as can be expected out of any equipment that is restricted to normal bias tapes. For a slightly better result, you can move to Chrome or Type 2 high bias tapes, which are even quieter still. And if you've really got the big bucks, or just too much money that you don't know what to do with, you can go all the way to Type 4 metal tape. But metal tape isn't manufactured anymore. The only way that you can get a hold of it is to buy new old stock on eBay. Now occasionally a deal will come up. I gave about $6 shipped for this particular tape in its sealed wrapper. But as of late, it seems that the only tapes that are showing up are going for $30 or more, which is absolutely ridiculous. You can certainly get pretty good performance, almost approaching that of the Type 4 tape, out of a good Type 2 or possibly even a Type 1 with appropriate noise reduction processes if you're not opposed to using them.
All of the noise reduction systems that I have discussed so far have all had one thing in common, and that is to say that they all require pre-processing or pre-encoding of the source material while you are preparing it. Well, what if there was a noise reduction system that could be applied to any possible source without requiring any kind of pre-encoding or pre-processing of the material being presented to the system? Well, there are a couple of systems that do that, but the one that I'm going to talk about tonight is probably the most popular of any of them, and it is known as dynamic noise reduction. Now, dynamic noise reduction is a system from National Semiconductor that requires no pre-encoding or pre-processing of the source material that is presented to it. No matter the source material, the DNR system tries to remove the noise using a couple of different methods, of which I will discuss more later. Now, I first became aware of the dynamic noise reduction system on GM vehicles from the mid-1980s to the mid-1990s, many of which had a button on them like this Buick radio does that is labeled DNR. Now, I didn't have a manual at the time or anything along those lines, so I always assumed that that button might be for Dolby noise reduction, but it's not. It is an implementation of the National Semiconductor Dynamic Noise Reduction System and it works on any source that the particular General Motors radio you have is capable of playing. It works on the tapes, it works on the radio. If you found one of these radios that had a CD player and a DNR button, it would probably work there too, although you wouldn't need it on a decently recorded CD because any CD with clean source material should be practically noiseless for all intents and purposes. I discovered the true function of this button when I finally got a hold of a manual for one of our 1980s Buicks and it explained the system in great detail saying that it was the dynamic noise reduction system and it could be used at any time and in fact General Motors advised leaving it on. Now today's General Motors radios no longer feature the DNR system and some of the last ones to feature it actually had an automatic DNR system that is to say there was no button to push. Of course, not every General Motors vehicle of the time had a radio that supported the DNR system. For example, this is the display from the radio in the Key Keeper's truck. And as you can very clearly see, there is a DNR indication there, but it never comes on and there's no button that enables you to use it. Of course, there's a number of unused elements in this display, some of which the functions can only be guessed about. If you've had a DNR indicator light up in a GM vehicle's radio display, I'd certainly love to know about it. I'd like to know if that character was ever used. Of course, that's just a little sidebar. On to the details of how the system actually works. The way that dynamic noise reduction works is very simple, and yet extremely clever at the same time. There are three basic things going on with the dynamic noise reduction system. The first is something known as psychoacoustic masking, of which I'll talk more about later. The second thing that goes on is a variable low-pass filtering scheme, and the third thing that goes on is a sort of noise-gating operation. To better understand the concept of noise-gating, or a gate in general, consider a microphone like this one. A microphone by itself has no ability to discriminate against unwanted sounds, other than by virtue of choosing a pickup pattern which might exclude the unwanted sound. But if you can't manage to do that, you can place a device known as a gate between your microphone and the rest of your sound equipment. The idea behind the gate is that when it is set right, it won't open at any time other than when the desired sound is coming through. So hopefully that will eliminate the unwanted sound from the finished product, be it a sound recording or a live performance or whatever. A low-pass filter works by cutting off or severely attenuating the frequencies above a certain point. For example, you might see a low-pass filter used in an AM radio tuner to cut out the high frequencies and a lot of the hash and static noise. Psychoacoustics is a whole nother field all to its own, and I am far from being an expert on it, but about the best thing that I can say regarding psychoacoustics, which refers to the study of our hearing and how it functions, is that our hearing is nothing less than amazing. 
The next time you're out and about in a public place, pay attention to what you hear and how you act upon it. Ordinarily, you probably don't even give such things a second thought. But dynamic noise reduction exploits this by doing something very clever. When dynamic noise reduction is working, it's working most during fairly quiet passages in the music, and it's actually low-pass filtering out the high frequencies so that you don't hear them, and you theoretically don't hear as much or even any tape hiss or noise at all. But when the music is playing and there's lots of instruments going on or there's lots of high frequency instruments playing, the low pass filtering technique becomes unsuitable because it's going to distort and destroy the music and you'll hear what it's doing. Well, The idea behind psychoacoustic masking is very simple. The theory is that when a more desired tone or sound is being played, you tend not to notice lesser intensity and potentially undesired sounds such as quiet tape hiss. A good way that I thought of to picture this would be imagine yourself sitting at home on a quiet day, there's nothing going on in the house, you can hear the leaves blowing outside, you can hear traffic going by on your street, you can even hear your heating and cooling system cycling on and off if you have one. But let's take that and change it up a little bit Let's put a band in the middle of your living room and let's say they're a really rocking band. All of a sudden you're not going to hear the leaves rustling outside. You're not going to hear most cars passing outside. And unless there's something seriously wrong with your heating and air conditioning system, you're not going to hear it cycling either. And that is the biggest trick that the dynamic noise reduction system pulls. And all of these different concepts work together to produce a noise reduction system that is said to be non-complementary. That is to say, you don't need to feed it specially encoded material. Furthermore, it's also compatible with some other noise reduction systems for just that much more noise reduction. So it sounds pretty cool, right? Well, how can you get it? That's where things get a little bit more difficult. I was not aware of any standalone devices that offered the dynamic noise reduction system until I saw one of V West Life's videos entired, entitled The Incorrect Music Archive. And then I saw that he had a very unique device sitting on top of his tape machine that bore the DNR logo, which is actually a kind of stylized type that is a registered trademark of National Semiconductor. And I asked him about it. I asked him if it was what I thought it was, and he responded that yes, it is a dynamic noise reduction system. He also said that they're rather uncommon, the system that he had. Fortunately, time and eBay brings everything around. And this particular device, which is the same one that he has, is known as the Dynamic Noise Reduction System 911. And this thing was manufactured by Advanced Audio Systems International Incorporated at once at 4040 Moore Park Avenue in San Jose, California, but certainly long since defunct. Now an interesting side note, although National Semiconductor stated that the dynamic noise reduction system was royalty free to use, it was at one time patented. And the two patent numbers given here, 3,678,416 and 3,753,159 are both registered to one Richard Berwin. Richard Berwin, for those who may not know the name, is an old specialist in the field of audio. He's been in the business a long time and his product today is known as the Berwin, Berwin Bo Bobcat audio processing system which performs a whole bunch of enhancement and stuff on audio. Now I don't have a copy of his software and it uh, costs rather more than I'm interested in spending but he has some demonstrations on his website that you can download and listen to to hear what he's been up to lately. But he devised the basic concepts upon which dynamic noise reduction is based which is interesting because the Wikipedia tells us and of course that's subject to all manner of disclaimers already that the dynamic noise reduction system is actually also based in part on the Philips dynamic noise limiter system which they say is unpatented. Now this device accepts connections from a phono preamp, tape play, tape record, and then it goes out 
to the tape loop on your receiver. So really to make the most use of this thing, you would need to have a stereo receiver that supports a tape loop, although you could certainly hook it up anyway. And it has controls on the front that allow you to take it in and out of circuit. That's the active and bypass button. There's a power button over here, and then there's the fun part, the audio bandwidth meter. And this is a strip of LEDs marked from 800 hertz all the way up to 30 kilohertz, which is technically beyond the 20 kilohertz range of human hearing. As you can see, the dynamic noise reduction system only affects a certain part of the audio signal. But as National Semiconductor tells us, the system works where tape hiss is the most severe. And so that's why it only goes from about 800 hertz on up to 30 kilohertz or so. But you can put the system into use by pressing the active button. There's an enhancement button over here, and unfortunately I don't have any instructions for this thing. So if you do, or you know somebody who does, I would greatly appreciate hearing from you. Because I would really like to know how to operate this thing 100% correctly. What I know about it is information that has simply been extrapolated from the already available National Semiconductor data sheets. But the enhancement button seems to restore some of the lost high end if you have to get pretty heavy handed with the DNR system. That's what the sensitivity control is for. The GM radios that I was talking about earlier that have this system on board have fixed sensitivity as far as I'm aware, except for possibly the ones that say auto DNR on them, and I don't know how that circuit works because I've never actually seen one of those sets in action. But the sensitivity control controls just how aggressive the DNR system is. The more aggressively you set the system, the harder it's going to come down on the high end. It's not going to open up the audio bandwidth as high as it could. And you really only have to get heavy handed with this thing if you're dealing with a particularly messed up source. In which case the damage that it does to the music may be better than what you had. But as you turn the sensitivity up, it actually becomes more tolerant and more willing to keep its bandwidth open and allow more of the high end through at the expense of also letting more tape hiss through. Now the unfortunate fact of the matter is that when it comes to getting one of these you're going to have to be lucky. You're going to have to do just like I did. You're going to have to sit on eBay and wait until one comes up or maybe one will show up in your thrift store. I have no idea how many of their, uh, how many of these there can be out there. I found two of them on eBay. I decided I wanted a spare in case something happened to the first one. Both of mine work just fine. I'd say on average they're worth between twenty and forty dollars depending on condition. Although they have a company name on the back, and although one of mine has a serial number on it, ranging into about the 8,000s, and assuming they were consecutive, maybe there were about 8,000 or maybe possibly more of them made. It's impossible to tell because, like I say, the company is long gone and any production records have surely perished at this point in time. But I think these might have been sold as kits and assembled by the end user. To look at the printed circuit board in one of these things, it's very primitive. You can tell that it's hand drawn, and the soldering in both of mine looks to have been done by hand and not at all by machine. So my guess is that these were either hand assembled by the Advanced Audio Systems Company, or they were sold as kits and people put them together, which means you could find them anywhere. Fortunately, there are some easier ways to get a hold of this system if you want it. You could always go out and do my favorite thing and buy yourself a nice late 1980s General Motors vehicle such as a wonderful 3800 powered Buick. But if for some unfathomable reason that's just not the kind of thing you want to do, you're not quite out of luck just yet. You can always buy the radio out of a GM vehicle and assuming it's working, you can run it from battery or even a benchtop regulated power supply and get your dynamic noise reduction fixed that way, although it's still a fixed system. You can't do much to adjust it unless you modify the set to include a sensitivity control, which wouldn't be too hard. All you would have to do is take a fixed resistor out of the circuit and replace it with a suitable potentiometer. And I believe that that is a 1K pot 
that is used in this thing. I'm not sure which taper it is. Don't know one way or the other about that. But there are easier ways to get a hold of this particular technology, and one of them comes from everyone's favorite technology store. That's right, Radio Shack. Here I have something that Radio Shack sold in different variations from about 1983 on up to 1987. Given that Radio Shack unquestionably mass-produced these things, it should be very easy to find one on the second-hand market. And again, I'd say they're worth between $10 and about $40. I gave about $10 in shipping for this one. Unfortunately, it cost more to ship it than it did to buy it, but that's a fact of life on eBay. And amongst this thing's many built-in capabilities, one of them is dynamic noise reduction. And you can take it both in and out of circuit. You can also adjust the intensity of the effect. And this control is actually wired in reverse compared to the one that is found on the DNR System 911. As you turn the dial up on the System 911, the effect of the dynamic noise reduction system becomes less and less, allowing more of the high end to come through. This thing does the opposite. The higher you turn this up, the more severe the effect becomes. And of course this thing has a few other nice features. There's a stereo synthesizer that either my particular example is broken or it just doesn't work that well. I would be in the side of the camp that says it doesn't work all that well because when I turned it on playing a monophonic radio source into it, it just made the sound go all out of phase and basically totally canceled any sound coming out of my left speaker by way of phase cancellation. There is a stereo expander and while it's not very fancy, it certainly does add a little something to the music, although its implementation is very simple. It's nothing more than a so-called slight delay of the audio signal using a so-called bucket brigade device, which is actually a very entertaining name for a semiconductor. To give you an idea of what bucket brigade devices are normally used to do, sometimes radio microphones such as CB microphones that have a built-in echo use bucket brigade devices because they're very simple and cheap to implement that echo. And of course you can hook up multiple sources to this thing such as your VCR or television, your stereo receiver, and one other device. So this is one way to find the dynamic noise reduction system if you're interested in having it. There is also another capability that this thing has. This thing can optionally decode Dolby Pro Logic surround, believe it or not they threw that in as kind of an 11th hour bonus from the looks of things because the circuitry in this thing is very simple and crude and to the point but as you can see there is a surround output that can be fed to a separate amplifier and fed to two more rear speakers for your system and if you're having problems with echoing or something like that you can actually delay the surround processed audio to make it sound right in your system and this is just an input to another bucket brigade device, this one with many more levels than the one that I believe is used for the stereo expander, so it can have a deeper effect on the delay of the sound. So that is probably the most cost-effective and common way for the average person to get their hands on the National Semiconductor Dynamic Noise Reduction System if they're interested in such a thing. Now, of course, this video wouldn't be complete without a demonstration, so I'm going to go downstairs, hook up my tape deck to, the, to this thing, and then to the computer, and I'll play a little bit of audio into this with and without dynamic noise reduction, and if YouTube's compression doesn't mangle things too much, hopefully you can see the effect that it has. Of course, again, I'm not going to guarantee that I'm using the system 100% properly, or that even after nearly 30 years of existence, because the date codes in this thing place its manufacture sometime around 1981, or at least that's when the components were picked, I'm not going to guarantee that this thing is in the best shape after all of these years. But to my ears, it seems to work, and it seems to work quite well. Now, for those of you out there who are solely concerned with the cool factor of your stereo system, as opposed to its actual performance, the DNR System 911 has you covered there as well, because if you like blinking lights, oh boy has it got them.
Now if you decide that you simply must have the DNR System 911 unit, and it is kind of cool looking, I will admit, but that's not the only reason why you should be after it. There is one on eBay as of the time this video is being made. However, the seller is asking $99.99 for it, and at that price they can just sit on it because it definitely isn't worth that. Although it does come with instructions as well as the uh, building information, which lends some reinforcement to the theory that these things began life as kits.